If you've ever been in the same room as a sitting U.S. president, then you know it's a pretty incredible experience. In August of 2000, I had the opportunity to go to Chicago with pastors from around the country to a leadership conference, and among the keynote speakers were best-selling Christian authors, Christians who happen to be CEOs of Fortune 500 companies, even an NBA team owner who happened to be a Christian. But a last-minute addition to the lineup was the current, at the time, president, President Bill Clinton. Now, before his session, we were asked to leave the room so that the Secret Service can come in and do a sweep of the room. I mean, they had bomb-sniffing dogs, like, walking around the aisles. They were setting up uh, metal detectors that we had to walk through to get back into the room. And honestly, there was some chatter in the lobby as all of that was happening among the attenders as to why he had been asked to come and speak to a room full of pastors on leadership. But regardless of how anyone felt about him personally or professionally, when the host said, and now, ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States, and he walked in, everyone stood up. Like, the energy in the room was electric. It, it surprised me. There was a sense of awe in the room because you knew you were standing in the presence of one of the most powerful men on the planet. Now, if that's how a room full of people responds when the president walks in, how should you and I respond when we come into the presence of God? If we haven't met yet, my name is Tom, and I get to serve as one of the pastors here at Owensboro Christian Church. And if you're visiting with us online or on TV, or you're here for the first time, you've picked a great week to jump in to worship as we continue this series on the life of David. Because today, we get to talk about one of the things that we do each and every week that we gather as a family of believers. Worship. And this is a topic that is near and dear to my heart, because you see, I started out in ministry as a student pastor at a church plant on the north side of Indianapolis. And it was a very transient community, people moving in and out of the community all the time because of job transfers, and it was a small church plant. And in one particular month, we lost everyone on our worship team to job transfers. So I sang a little bit in high school. Uh, I sang and traveled for a group uh, for the college that I went to, and I knew three chords on the acoustic guitar. So I picked up a guitar, and I started leading worship for this church plant, and that began a 20-year journey as a worship pastor, where I got to lead congregations of a couple hundred to several thousand each week and even got to travel nationally and internationally to lead worship and to teach on worship. So I love talking about worship. But so does the Bible. In fact, David, whose life we are studying, he wrote many worship songs in the Bible called Psalms. And by reading them, we get to see how people in Scripture are encouraged to worship God. For instance, by reading the Psalms, and we're going to get to our text in 2 Samuel in just a second, but by reading the Psalms, we learn that we're invited to worship God with music. Psalm 47, 6 says to sing praises to God, sing praises to our King, sing praises. In Psalm 150, people are encouraged to praise the Lord with the sounding of the trumpet, the harp, and the lyre. That's like a smaller version of a harp. With the tambourine and dancing, praise him with the strings and flute, with the clash of cymbal. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. So these two verses and many other verses in the Bible, they give us example and they show us and it's the reason why we worship God each week like we do. So we're using a variety of instruments. We make music and we sing and we give thanks to God and we celebrate him. We even offer prayers through our singing to God all through music. 
But the Bible also tells us that we are invited to worship God with our bodies. And we got a glimpse of this in Psalm 150, where it says that you can dance before the Lord. And in our text this morning, we're going to see David do just that. But worship to God with our bodies, it's way broader than that one example. The theologian and author Robert Foster said it this way. He said, throughout scripture, we find a variety of physical postures in connection with worship. Lying face down, standing, kneeling, lifting the hands, clapping, lifting the head, bowing the head, and dancing. The point is that we are to offer God our bodies as well as all the rest of our being. Worship is appropriately physical. And one of the things that reminded me of this was my years of ministry as a worship pastor. When people would come to me and ask me this question, they would say, so what's the deal with people raising their hands? Like, that feels weird. Now, if you're newer to faith or to God, like, it's a, it's a, it's a valid question. Like, what would cause someone to do that? And while scripture tells us that it's okay for people to respond to God in worship, it didn't click into me until I had my first child. And my son, Josh, at the time was two years old and standing at the window of his bedroom watching me mow the lawn. And I can picture it in my mind like it happened yesterday. And as I was making the rows in the lawn like you do, and I came and I faced the house for the first time, and he was standing there. If you remember from Josh, he was here this past summer. Big smile on his face. Don't know where he gets that from. So, um, so Josh, when he saw me come towards him, got this big smile, and his arms went straight up in the air. Like he was saying, Dad, pick me up. And I smiled at him as I was walking towards the house. And then I turned away and I looked over my shoulder. And I saw that he, his hands went down and his face got sad. And then I turned back towards the house for the next row and boom, his hands went right back up. And he got this smile on his face and it hit me. My child just wants to be close to his dad. Just like those of us who know God as our father want to be close to him. And, to, and so to express that, some believers raise their hands in worship. Have you ever been to a sporting event where your favorite team scores like the last minute touchdown or the last minute goal or drives in the game winning run? What does the crowd do? Woo! Right? The whole, everyone raises their hands in victory. And so sometimes believers raise their hands knowing that it's the blood of Christ, not their own life, the blood of Jesus that saves us, that forgives us, that give us, gives us hope for eternity and today. And yet sometimes believers might raise their hands as a form of surrender to God, like physically receiving from the Lord whatever God is doing or wants to do in their life. Like, God, would you, would you do a work in my life? I, I surrender to you whatever it is that you want. We can kneel or bow in reverence. We can raise our hands in victory or surrender or for a desire for greater intimacy, which all speaks to the last expression we'll look at before we dive into our text. We're invited to worship God with our emotions. Psalm 33 verse 1 tells us to sing joyfully to the Lord. And David wrote in Psalm 55, evening, morning, and noon, I cry out to God in distress, and he hears my voice. We can worship God with tears of sorrow, tears of joy, distress, and everything in between. There are so many expressions of worship to God. The point is that God's inviting all of who we are, mind, body, and emotions, to worship him for all that he is. And that's what's happening in our text. 
in 2 Samuel chapter 6 as David is leading a parade of people carrying the Ark of the Covenant, the physical representation of God's presence on earth in the Old Testament, as they're carrying the Ark, as they're leading the Ark into the city of Jerusalem. And so as we begin to read our text today, would you please stand out of respect for God's word? 2 Samuel chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. David again brought together all the able young men of Israel, 30,000 of them. He and all his men went to Baela in Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name, the name of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim on the ark. So 30,000 people are marching towards Jerusalem, and they're talking about the presence of God between the, the angels on the ark, and the party's about to get started. All right, look at verse 5. David and all of Israel were celebrating with all their might before the Lord with castanets and harps and lyres and timbrels and sistrums and cymbals. So the whole band's playing. All right, they're about to get ready, about to get crazy, and it's getting a little wild because look at verse 14. Wearing a linen ephod, those are the undergarments that priests wore under their outer robes. So wearing only the undergarments, David was dancing before the Lord with all his might, while he and all Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouts and the sound of trumpets. As the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michael, David's wife, daughter of Saul, watched from a window. And when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Please go ahead and have a seat. So uh, a few weeks ago, I demonstrated... David's use of a sling, right? Remember that? I didn't kill anybody, right? Threw the, threw the peppermint right down the aisle, demonstrating the sling as David killed Goliath. Rest assured, I will not be demonstrating David dancing in his underwear before the Lord. <laughs> right? I got, yeah? Listen, don't applaud too loud. That hurts. That hurts. Listen, I, I get it. Listen, nobody wants to see that. Ain't nobody got time for that. <laughs> that would be bad. <laughs> Again, shortest tenure of a pastor here at OCC. <laughs> but what we do need to see are the differences in response to worship from David and Michael. One was so excited to be in the presence of God that they worshiped with all their might, and the other stood at a distance and despised the one Worshiping. I mean, same God was present. And two very different responses. And as I was preparing for this message, I started to think about all my years as a worship pastor and all the conversations I've had with people in churches through the years. And I've started to think about even my own heart at times when it comes to how I've responded to worship to God. And I started to think about some questions like, why is it that we don't bring all of who we are, happy, sad, tears, distress, anxiety, joy, like what keeps us from bringing all of who we are, not just when we gather together as a body of believers each week, but every day of our lives to God in worship? Like I started to wonder, have there been more times in my life that I've responded more like Michael and less like David in worship? I think the question that this te text is leading us to is this. What keeps us from responding to God in worship like we could? And to answer that, we need to read a bit more of the story from 2 Samuel chapter 6, as David arrives home to the palace after leading this party procession to Jerusalem. Look at verse 20. When David returned home to bless his household, Michael, daughter of Saul, 
came out to meet him and said, how the king of Israel has distinguished himself today, going around half naked, in full view of the slave girls of his servants, as any vulgar fellow would. I mean, can't you hear the contempt in her voice as she's saying this? And David said to Michael, it was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father or anyone from his household when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people Israel. Now, time out. David, even though he may be saying this really humbly, made a little faux pas, like when you're in an argument with the spouse, don't bring up the in-laws. Like, just don't. Just don't do that. That never ends well. David did it, but don't do it. And he said, and I will celebrate before the Lord. And I'll become even more undignified than this. And I'll be humiliated in my own eyes. But by these slave girls you spoke of, I will be held in honor. You see, one of the things I think that keeps us from worshiping God like we could is when we care more about what others think than what God thinks. And we could just picture Michael up in the window of her palace room watching David, can't we? I mean, by her expression, by her words. David's out there dancing before the Lord. You just see her standing there going, like, look at him. What a fool. Dancing around in his underwear before the Lord. Like, what are people going to think of him? What are they going to think of me? He's supposed to be the king. I think, like many of us, Michael became more concerned and found her value in the opinions of others. And to an extent, like, we know that that's normal, right? Like, we, we find ourselves and our value in the opinions of others. It's why we got up this morning and we got dressed the way we did and we hopefully brushed our teeth and we hopefully put deodorant on, right? We did these things because we want to be accepted. We don't want to repel anyone. Uh, we want to be admired. We want to be liked. And there's nothing wrong with valuing what others think, listen, until it blocks our ability to worship God like he's calling us, wherever we are in our walk, to worship him. And that's what happened to Michael here. And I know that in a room this size and with people watching on TV or online, that we arrive to worship with a variety of different life experiences and a, a variety of different circumstances happening in our hearts and our mind each week. Some of us came to worship this morning with joy in our hearts, and some, if we're honest, a profound sense of sadness and loss. Some of us came to worship with relative peace in our hearts, and some of us with a high level of anxiety. Some of us came with an awareness and gratitude in our hearts for all that God has done. And some of us came with serious doubts about like, is God even real? Like, is this faith thing even for real? And maybe you came into church this morning after just having a fight with your spouse on the way here. You're arguing in the car and you get out and you see a bunch of smiling faces who are welcoming you and you're just fighting in the car and then you walk in and people say good morning and you're like, hey, good morning, yeah, everything's good, yeah. Right? Like we do that, like we, we put on the mask. Or maybe you arrived to church and you were a few minutes late because you were frazzled, you're just trying to get the kids dressed and like stop them from killing each other and you pulling your hair out just to get to church. Listen, friends, Scripture teaches us that we, when we step into the presence of God, we don't need to wear a mask. That God is inviting you to bring all of who you are in this moment, happy, sad, tears, joy, gratitude, and doubts into the presence of God. And if you think about it, Michael was so concerned about what others might think of her and her husband that she missed out on experiencing the presence of God herself, and it sounds like she could have used it. 
It sounds like she could have needed a little God in her life for the way she responded. And there are a variety of different ways that we can worship, but isn't it always easier to sit back and critique others' worship than to lay down our own insecurities and try to honestly engage God like we could? With great concern for what others were thinking, Michael stayed in her safe tower of critical judgment and missed the presence of God. But these verses also tell us that we are sometimes kept from worshiping God like we could when we judge worship based on our own personal preferences. Notice again the tone and words that Michael used with David. She said, how the king has distinguished himself today. Like she was expecting and hoping and preferred that her husband, the king, act like a king when he worshiped. And it was her preferences that prevented her from joining in on worshiping and celebrating the presence of God. And I know, (laughs) I know I am treading some dangerous waters when I start to talk about preferences in worship because look, preferences in worship are tricky. They are. Just like we all show up to this place with different challenges and different experiences that we bring in that are unique to ourselves, we each walk into this place each week with preconceived ideas of what we think worship should look like. And in 20 years as a worship pastor, I can tell you I've had people come up to me and share with me, whether I ask for it or not, their personal preference on everything under the sun in worship from how fast or slow a song should be to the style or age of the song to how loud or soft the music should be to what the room should look like and on and on and on. You know the problem with preferences? Preferences are like armpits. Everyone has them and sometimes people think yours stink. (laughs) It's true. Right? You have preferences. I have preferences. I may think yours stink. You may think mine stinks, just like armpits. Preferences are so subjective. They're subjective. And for many of us who've grown up in the church, the style of worship, and I've learned this through the years, the style of worship that brought us to faith is often the style of worship that we are drawn to personally. And that's awesome. Nothing wrong with having a favorite style of worship, friends, but listen, the danger is we can become like Michael, where our preferences for how we worship become more important than who we are worshiping. That we become critical spectators rather than honest participants in worship to God because of our preferences. And when that happens, the very thing that's supposed to draw our hearts and our minds to God becomes about us. Where it's about what we want and not praising the God who gave his son for us. Which is why I love this quote from pastor and author Paul David Tripp. He reminds us that corporate worship is a regular, gracious reminder that it's not about you. It's not about me. You've been born. I've been born into a life that's a celebration of another. There's a great book by uh, author and pastor Gary Thomas, and I recommend this book to everyone. It's called Sacred Pathways. In it, he outlines nine different ways that people, based on their wiring and their personality, best encounter God in their own private worship. So for others, they encounter God like me, like in nature. For some, it's through loud, celebrative music. For some, it's through intellect and study. For some, it's through service. For for some, it's through quiet solitude. For some, it's through speaking up for, for others who can't speak for themselves. And you can even take a test that helps you find the best way that you can encounter 
God yourself. So say, take some time and find out the best way you, you encounter God. But friends, don't fall into the trap of expecting or even demanding that others share or participate in your preferences. If that happens, we become like Michael and we will be kept from encountering God like we could. And still other times we're kept from worshiping God like we could when God doesn't act like we think he should. Earlier in this chapter, the ark, as it's being brought into the city of David, it's on a cart, and some animals are pulling the ark, and the, the cart begins to tip, and a man named Uzzah, he reaches out his hand to steady the ark and touches the ark, and he dies. In verse 8, we read that David was angry because the Lord's wrath had broken out against Uzzah. And then David's anger turns to fear as David decided to leave the ark in a nearby home. He was afraid to take it any further. And then he finds out three months later how well this house is doing because they're experiencing the presence of God in the house. And then David goes back and gets the ark and takes it the rest of the way home. You see, David didn't think Uzzah should have died. And David got mad at God and his anger turned to fear and for a time, David literally walked away from the presence of God. You ever get mad at God when he doesn't do what you want him to do? You ever know somebody who got mad at God because God didn't heal the relationship, fix the mess that they made, keep someone from passing, heal the body? God didn't do what we wanted and you ever know somebody that walked away from him as a result of that? Look, when God shows up like we want him to, it's easy to worship him. But when he doesn't do what we want him to, sometimes we get mad and we may even walk away for a while. Case in point, every once in a while, I'll get on social media and I'll see someone post something good that happened in their life. And then they'll follow it with the phrase, God is good. Right? You ever see this? Right, And so uh, someone, like, they'll have a, a surgery that went well, and they'll post, surgery went well, God is good. Right? We've all seen that. But rarely do you see someone post that back half of that phrase when something bad happens. Like, got a flat tire today, God is good. Right? You, you, don't, you don't see that very often, right? Why? Because we tend to praise God more when he does what we want. But on the flip side, you ever see somebody who's really going through a difficult season and they continue to worship God? Like, that's inspiring. We have dear friends of ours in Indianapolis who have a special needs daughter who's about 20 years old right now. And uh, Anna is a beautiful child of God. But Ronnie and Heather, their parents, her parents, it's a lot of work to care for Anna. It takes 24-7, 365. And they love her and they care for her well, but it is difficult for them. And yet Ronnie and Heather every week come to church and they worship and they serve. And my family has been blessed specifically by their service. And it's inspiring because it's a reminder, friends, that while our, our circumstances might change, that God is and always will be creator, sustainer, redeemer, Lord, and savior. And in our best day or in our worst day, he is worthy of our praise. And at the end of the day, I think, I think we struggle to worship God like we could when God's not the primary focus of our hearts. I think we wrestle often with God being the primary place of our hearts and something else creeping in. Maybe it's money or, or sex or popularity or status or appearance or entertainment or leisure or sports or friends and the list goes on and on and on. And friends, God gave us all of these things to enjoy but the danger becomes when they take primary place in our hearts. 
If you think about how many bad decisions in human history have been made by people who worshipped something created rather than the God who created it. Which is why I love this quote by Pastor Tim Keller. He said, what you worship will direct your life. You want to change your behavior? Change what or who you worship. David encountered the presence of God and responded with music, with his whole body and with his emotions. Michael's critical spirit and preferences blinded her from experiencing the presence of God. So imagine, for just a moment, imagine if I said right now, and now, ladies and gentlemen, the creator and sustainer of the universe, God. And God showed up. I mean, I think we'd respond in some way, shape, or form, right? I mean, we may scream, we may pass out, we may have an accident, right? We may, we may fall to the ground. We're going to respond in some way. And the Bible says that when Jesus returns, that every knee will bow. Like, here's the response. Every knee will, will bow and every tongue in heaven and on earth and under the earth will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Like, that will be the response for everyone. But until that day comes, Jesus gave us this assurance in Matthew chapter 18, verse 20, when he said, For where two or three gather together as my followers, I am there among them. Guess what? Like we gather in the name of Jesus. And so the presence of God is here. And God is ready to do a work in your life. He's ready to do a work in your heart. He's ready to do a work in you and through you for the sake of others. The question is, how will you respond, not just today as we're gathered, but every day of your life to the presence of God? And we're going to wrap up our time together this week in a form of extended worship. We're just going to have some time when we get to respond to God. And I would encourage you to try to put aside any critical judgment that you have. To try to put aside any judgmental spirit. To try to not think about what other people might be thinking. I mean, I'm not saying to be a distraction for the whole room, you know. Nobody should be dancing in their underwear. Like, don't do that. But what would, what would it look like for you to bring who you are to God right now in worship? Maybe your doubts. Maybe your fears. Maybe as you're mourning something. Maybe your surrender to God. God, I, I don't know what you want to do in my life, but I surrender. I've been trying it on my own for way too long. I need you. And I would encourage you to take whatever posture you need to take in these next few minutes. For some of us, that's going to be staying seated and head bowed as we pray to God, maybe for the first time in a long time. For some of us, that may just be standing, trying to receive, not even singing, but just receiving from the Lord. For some of us, that may be we stretch ourselves a little bit. And we want to be close to the Father. God, would you, would you pick me up? I need to be close to you. God, I celebrate the victory that is yours through Christ in my life. Whatever posture you take in these next few moments, friends, God is here and he is worthy of our praise. And so God, we come to you and now in this moment. And God, I pray that we would bring all of who we are, wherever we are in our walk with you, questions, fears, doubts, joy, 
not worried about what other people will think, as maybe we shed some tears, as maybe we lift our hands to be close to you to surrender, as maybe we sit or we kneel before you because of who you are. God, we thank you that we don't have to wear a mask, that you invite us to be who we are and bring it to your feet. And so God, I pray that we would do that in these next few moments. We thank you for your presence here and we worship you in this place. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen.